Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 219. How do you do, fellow kids? I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record all of our podcast episodes live on Twitch Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love it when folks join us. So tonight, we're going to be recommending some games we think would be great for older teens, which could be interesting. We follow that up with reviews of Boop and Tapple. We finish off with a look at the games we've been playing recently, which includes one of our monthly Barbershop Bar game events and both our first thoughts on Seas of Havoc. We call out a lot of stuff during the show. You can find links to all of it through our show notes at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 219. Links there may be affiliate links, which help support this show, and some products discussed on tonight's program were provided by publishers for review. Let's get going with a trip to the Suggestion Box. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share some of the comments and other interactions we've gotten on our content. Let's start short and simple. Nim commented on our Viticulture World Unboxing to say, Viticulture as a co-op, co-op sounds weird, but fascinating. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to expect with that one. It is quite different while still being somewhat the same. So I got to say it's actually different enough. I'm actually surprised it wasn't released by Stonemaier as a full standalone game and not an expansion for Viticulture because there really is enough changes there. Plus, I don't think you'd need to have played Viticulture to play this. So it probably could have stood on its own. Now, with the basement woes, we've fallen behind on this one. Uh, We've only tried the first intro scenario, um, Green Gully, I think it was called, based on Charterstone, and it was quite fun. But as it stands, I can't even get to my copy of Viticulture right now. Viticulture World I can, that's set aside, but I can't get to my copy of Viticulture. But I will say, based on that one play, I think it, it was pretty solid. Who I really think will like it are the people who love Viticulture, the people who are really into it and really good at Viticulture. And like do Viticulture tournaments and play it as often as they can. And it's one of those games they rated a a 9 or a 10 on Board Game Geek. The the true fans of Viticulture. The ones who had the original edition and still bought the essential edition. Because I think those are the people who are going to love the changes and the way the game evolved and the new ways of playing. It requires a slightly different way of thinking that I found really enjoyable. Well, thanks for the comment, meme, or an enemy, or however that username's pronounced. Well, next up, a comment on our Disney Sidekicks review by someone who got sucked in by the theme and box. Back in 7 writes, awful game for families. We started with ourselves and two children, 8 and 11, playing, and the two children walked out after two games. It just wasn't fun. We even tried another time to get rid of the adjacent space instruction and allow more actions per turn, i.e. move to a space and rescue villagers as a single action and be able to attack the same villain multiple times per turn to induce much more family fun. That's kind of the takeaway from this game. It could have had an easy, medium and hard variation Mm -hmm. with very few changes so everyone was happy. But instead, even after simplifying it outside of the documented rules, Our children have consigned it to a dust-covered shelf. Yeah, I can't really argue with any of that, sadly. Um, This is why I tend to point people to our review all the time. So I'm like, no, no, like here, when I'm sharing deals on the game, on our tabletop deals accounts, I usually will point people to our review because I don't want them to make this mistake. I don't want them to make the same mistake Beck and Seven did and pick up the game expecting a cute, fun family game. Disney Sidekicks is a brutally hard cooperative game that will challenge even experienced co-op game players. Now, for that genre, it's great. If you want a difficult cooperative game that's really going to challenge your group and rely on some luck as well as good maneuvering, that's fantastic for that. I just wish it was advertised that way so people knew what they were getting into. Well, it seems our Shobu content is getting a lot of attention, which is great. So here's a series of comments we've gotten over the last couple of weeks. Mike Robinson says, I love any game that I can play while camping using rocks and sand. (laughs) Patrick writes, such a great game. I'm a big fan of two-player abstracts. Your unboxing and review cemented the deal. Good job. Really looking forward to your review of The Night Cage by Atzmerkendagger. This one landed well with my gaming group. 
Dave Hutchinson commented, This game was taught to me by Deanna Tuzanio and was really fun. Totally enjoyed my time playing it. It seemed to be a fairly easy game to play, but then it forces you to try and outthink your opponent in trying to guess their next move and how mm -hmm. it will affect your moves. Very nice board and pieces. And finally, Mervranus1 commented over on Board Game Geek to say Shobu would have, have to be my favorite two-player abstract strategy game, but I'm a little biased. Thanks for putting together a great review, gents. For your information, that last one appears to be Manolis Varanis, one of the actual designers of the game. Uh, it's good to see this one taking off. Uh, we're still enjoying Shobu. Deanna and I actually played a couple of rounds just this past weekend on Sunday, and we'll be talking about that when we get to the Bellhops Tabletop segment at the end of the show. Um, uh, regarding these comments, uh, starting at the top, I agree with Mike. Um, I do like that I could actually make Shobu sitting on the beach or out camping somewhere. I could totally see sitting around a campfire in the pinery or something and going, hey, I'm bored. Here, grab the pieces. So actually, I'd probably just drive back my version of the game to play it. Because one of the bonuses is it's also nice and weather resistant. So even if you don't want to make your own, um, it, I, I do have to say it's nice to be able to play it anywhere. Um, then as for Patrick, uh, the night cage is, is behind me, actually, in a pile you can't quite see. It's just below my shoulder. It is one of our piles of obligation waiting to be unboxed. That's one we brought back from Origins. Unfortunately, that's on hold um, until I figure out something to do for unboxing videos. We may have to go back to our old format at some point. And as for Dave and Manois, or Manolis, sorry, Manolis, uh, thanks for the comments. Well, next up, a comment on our Psycho Babble review, where we learn more about the Outset Media Guy. Outset Media Games commented to say, Thank you for sharing the review, and thank you for taking Psycho Babble to review at Paul's insistence. He's the Outset Media Guy. We appreciate it, Mo, and glad it won you over. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks for the heads up, Outset Media. Um, I hope Paul got a raise or something, or at least you bought him a drink. He did a great job selling the game, as Sean said, like like props to him for knowing his audience and knowing just what his game could do. Well, next we have some pub game suggestions from Ewan Hill. They commented on episode 216 Pub Crawl to say, When Abs and I manage to have a night off from the kids, we'll often head down to our local town and crawl a few pubs with our two players at hand. Jaipur, nice. Paris, La Cité de la Lumière, and Fungi are three that always come to mind where you don't need a bigger table than you'd expect with two. Nice. Uh, the, some great suggestions there, Owen. We'll be sure to toss those in our show notes. All right. Well, we left the biggest for last. This comment comes from Kedrick Winks, the designer of Psychobabble, who caught our review on Board Game Geek. They had some clarifications that we thought were worth sharing. Hi, Tabletop Bellhop. I've just read your review of my game, Psychobabble. It sounds like you have, an, uh, have unexpectedly enjoyed the game a great deal. It is an excellent and comprehensive review, and I just wanted to say thank you for all the effort that has gone into it. I also wanted to say that I note the issue of problematic language in the game and do take ableism seriously. Mental health issues are very close to my heart, and the game was designed firstly to give a social deduction game in which my wife wouldn't feel uncomfortable lying, but secondly, to engender some empathy, engender some empathy and place people in the shoes of those who can't trust their own point of view. I tried to remove the sensitivity of the issue as much as possible by setting it in the fictional Arkham Asylum and using more outdated terms like psychotherapist and insane. To further address the issue, the original game rules included the following text. Finally, if you're experiencing feelings of confusion, alienation, paranoia, and self-doubt, then you are playing the game correctly. Although this game is entertainment, it does aim to give a small ta taste of what it might be like to doubt your own reason and to lose trust in those around you. It is designed to evoke an emotional response and hopefully relief when all is revealed at the end of the round. If this makes you unduly uncomfortable or it's too close to home, then consider talking about these feelings with the other players, someone you trust, or seeking professional advice. We take people's mental health very seriously, and instead of making light of it with this game, we hope to get more people talking about it. Mental health problems can happen to anyone at any time in their lives. The more we talk about it, the more barriers we break down and lessen the stigma surrounding it. 
This text was unfortunately cut for reasons of brevity and perhaps levity by the publisher. So far, you are the first players to bring the issue up that I know of, but I do think it's right to bring it up. I hope that you can enjoy the game a little more now, knowing that rather than trivializing mental health issues, the game seeks to explore and destigmatize them, even if just a little. Again, thanks for the review, and I hope you get the chance to play some of my other games in the future. Thanks, Kedrick. Well, I gotta say, thank you very much for that, Kedrick. Um, I, I was very pleased to read this, I, I think is the, is the best thing I can say. When I got this message, um, he did reach out on Board Game Geek, and I asked his permission to be able to share that here with everyone listening. Um, I, I'm just baffled by why Outset cut that part for the game. So props for pointing out who Outset Media Guy was, but this to me is an important note about this game that wouldn't have had us wondering about the sensitivity issues, like like wondering if they were trying to capitalize on mental illness as opposed to address it and make it more aware. The feelings it's meant to invoke and why, I think is part of the game, and I'm sorry it wasn't in there. Now, this has made me respect the game and its designer even more. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the designer for thinking of such things and trying to, as we noted, use the genre appropriately while also respecting the feelings and needs of others playing. Yeah. It's frustrating when publishers leave out things like this, which frankly shows a lack of respect for modern players. Well, now, thank you to everyone who interacts with our content. While comments are great and there's a chance we will read them out on the show, we also appreciate every thumbs up, like, share, and quote. Let's take a time to stop by the lobby. Uh, let's see how the awesome folks who joined us live tonight here on Twitch are doing this fine Wednesday afternoon. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Lamb Curry 666 who asked, what are the best games to play with older teen kids? I, this should be an interesting one. Um, leading up to tonight, I wasn't sure what our topic was going to be. So I'm like, you know what, here's a challenge. I'm going to open up our question list. So I have a big Excel file with all the questions everyone ever sent us. And I'm like, whatever the first question on the list is, that's it. That's what we're going to do. And I planned this ahead of time, so we had time to do any research. And, well, that was the top question from Lam Curry 666 who uh, actually asked the question during one of our Twitch live streams. Uh, for those of you who aren't here live, that's at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, where you go live Wednesday nights. So it was during one of those shows this question came up. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, why I think it's going to be really interesting is, well, we're both over 40, and we both have kids that both are teens, but not what I would consider older teens at this point. Um, some barely teenagers. And I kind of feel like we're we're sitting here and like if I had had a skateboard in the house, I would have grabbed it because I feel like I'm doing the 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 fellow kids meme from 30 Rock. Right. The, the one with Steve Buscemi and the skateboard where he's trying to fit in with the kids at high school. And in case you weren't sure we were old. Yes, we just explained a meme verbally. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, we just did, or at least I did that. So so this is going to be an attempt at us trying to appeal to the younger generation, I guess, uh, with a game suggestion list that ended up including 31 games, but split over kind of nine main game types with a highlight game for each of those. So please note that we aren't qualified in any way to do this other than having teenage kids of our own and knowing a lot about board games. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, we both had different takes on this question. Now, mm -hmm. Mo approached this as what games older teens want to play with each other. Yeah. Well, I was looking at what games us old folks could play and enjoy with those older teens together. Interesting. We'll get two different points of view on each of these games. Now, the one obvious thing we have to say anytime we're talking about kids, and I know we're not talking about little kids, but we have talked about little kids on the show, is every kid is different, even older teens and young adults. Every person is different. I probably should say at this point, obviously, what works for one isn't going to work for another. And especially when you're talking about teens, there is a can be a huge range in maturity level between teens, even older teens. Um, so. The thing, though, that's very different here than when talking, especially, say, about preschoolers, is that teen's personal preference is going to play a big part in what games they are willing to play and what they may or may not enjoy. It's a little different with a kid where you present it to them and they either take to it or they don't. This is going to be before you even get to the table. I'm sure you're going to hear an opinion on the game before you start playing. In fact, I think this is sort of the point where kids have really developed their tastes and are going to be far more self-sufficient. 
In fact, my take, and the reason I answered this question the way I did, is that I feel generally as an older teen, I would recommend games exactly the same as I would recommend to an adult. Uh, I, you know, at a certain point, they're just another one of our listeners and they aren't any different than our normal people. So while back in the day, we were quite limited as to what resources we had available to us. Mm -hmm. Now the world is there for them to pick and choose from with all the reviews and content to help them choose to their tastes. Yeah, you can listen to people like us, old dudes who tell you what to play or instead of just walking into Leisure World at the mall and going, hey, that's uh, from the same company as that other game I like. Now, I considered the usual thing. So the usual thing we do on a game recommendation episode is we don't just give you a list of games. It's one of the things that I feel sets us apart from some of uh, the other podcasters out there. We like to talk about like why we're recommending these games and and what the topic's really about. And in this case, I feel um, I'm not really qualified to do this. And I think it's already a little embarrassing that we're making references to memes and in, te- in text and, uh, and 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 talking about them. And and I think in this case, instead of talking about what we think teens will like or what teens are into nowadays, I think we're just going to jump right to the games. But what we are going to do is explain why we think it'll work with older teens. But I'll be talking about how an adult can use this as a way to hang out and enjoy some game time with those older teens, just like Steve Buscemi. Now, these suggestions are going to be based both on what we enjoyed when we were teens and what we've seen local kids playing and talking about. Because one of the things Sean did miss is we have gamed with local teens at some of our public play events. We do get a wide range of players out to say our barbershop bar events and other events we've had here in Windsor in the past, as well as con games we've taken part in and so on. So we're, it's not like we're completely separated. Our, our fingers aren't that far away from the pulse here. Now get off my lawn while we give our opinions in mostly no particular order. All right. I'm going to totally mess everything up starting right away because uh, if you looked at the name of this episode, I put board games for older teens. And while that's done for SEO purposes, we are a tabletop gaming podcast. And I am going to start with a tabletop game that is not a board game. And I can't help but start with Dungeons and Dragons. And that's for a number of reasons. Now, for one. That's what I was into when I was an older teen. That is, we played hours and hours, multiple uh, days a week, specifically Saturdays, noon till midnight, guaranteed, played role-playing games. Now, yes, Dungeons and Dragons was one of those. Uh, back then for us, it was second edition Dungeons and Dragons, advanced, sorry, advanced Dungeons and Dragons, second editions. Let's get, let's get the, the edition correct. Um, But we played a ton of other pen and paper RPGs, which included Warhammer, Cyberpunk, Paranoia, Merp, and many more. I I could go on for hours just talking about the games we used to love. Now, I am calling out Dungeons & Dragons specifically, though, because of its current unprecedented popularity. And based on the local groups I see and the discords I'm part of and the Facebook groups and and, and the meetups I get invited to, This is what a lot of at least Windsor area teens are into or trying to get into. Because I also get a lot of emails going, Mo, supposedly you're the local game guy. Do you know anyone starting a D&D game? I get that once or twice a week. Now, having both gone through it ourselves, I think one of the biggest things that's important about Dungeons & Dragons or an RPG group is that an RPG group is something special you are going to form bonds of a kind that are hard to find and form elsewhere, more so than a board game group, more so than necessarily a sports team. There is something more personal about sharing your feelings and getting into characters. Almost all of my lifelong friends are people I've sat at a table and enjoyed an RPG with. RPGs are also great for feeling part of something. And being part of an active and passionate community, that's more true now than it ever has been. The online Dungeons & Dragons community is massive. And while sometimes they're arguing amongst themselves and sometimes they don't like what the parent company is doing with the game, there's still that feeling of being part of something. So this is why I put this as uh, as the first thing up. So I'd like, like, yes, no particular order, but this is number one. And I kept it number one. I didn't save it for last. This is my number one suggestion. If you are going to get teens into games, get them into RPGs. Now, D&D is, of course, the most well-known and the most popular right now, but there are plenty of other choices. And if you want to talk RPGs and the different varieties and what's out there, we can do that some other episode. 
So sitting down and running an RPG for your older teens and their friends can be a great way to interact with them, using your knowledge and experience in a way that isn't competitive and can help them experience a bit of that world of RPGs for themselves with the help of someone with more experience. Similarly, if you've got a developing GM, the fact that you as an adult are interested in playing through a game with them as the guide can be a huge confidence boost. Mm -hmm. Just make sure they aren't getting overly anxious at trying to please you as an adult. And I would just add to that, be prepared to back off eventually. They're probably, once you get them started, are going to form their own groups, their own group of friends, and probably aren't going to want dad or mom hanging around anymore once they get into the games. All right, my next big suggestion, um, I picked a specific game here, but also a genre, is Star Wars Imperial Assault. Because the one thing I remember having way more of when I was a teen is time. Like I said, playing 12-hour RPG sessions wasn't uncommon, nor was things like setting up a game of Talisman with all the expansions and deciding we can't finish until we played every character. Every character's died at least once, and we played over four days. It's the kind of things we did back then. That's where Star Wars Imperial Assault comes in. While each individual game is fairly short, playing through a whole campaign is going to take you quite a bit of time. You can play this one versus many. If you want that RPG feel, if you want someone to play the Empire and everyone else picking their own heroes to play, you can do that. Or nowadays, the game's been updated with an app, which lets you do a full cooperative experience so all of you can be on the same team. Now, the other reason I suggest this one in particular is because really you get two games in one. In addition to the big story-based campaign and all of the different modules and expansions you can add to that, excuse me, modules and expansions you can add to that and things like character progression and, you know, building your lightsaber as a Jedi, you also get a really solid two-player skirmish war game in the same box. You can use all the characters to fight each other. So you're basically getting two different games in one based on if you've got, you know, a five-player group of friends can play together and do the full campaign on the weekends, but then on Tuesday nights, two of you can get together and play out a couple battles. Plus, it's Star Wars. Everyone loves Star Wars, right? Like, uh, kids are still into Star Wars. Come on, a new episode of Ahsoka came out last night. People still must be into Star Wars. I don't think I'm that out of touch. Now, for people who don't love Star Wars, just in case I'm completely wrong, um, really what I'm recommending here is dungeon crawling games, dungeon crawling board games. My One of my favorite being Star Wars, and it has that bonus of being a skirmish game. But you could also, if you're into fantasy, check out Gloomhaven. Um, as we always say, start with Jaws of the Lion or Descent Legends of the Dark in the Dark. Then there's many others. Now, as an adult, we know all too well that finding time for those knockdown drag out sessions can be tough. But holiday weekends and such are great opportunities when combined with enough coffee to show those kids you've still got what it takes to stay up late and game till dawn. However, you don't need to play multiple games in one sitting. I do recommend, however, when breaking this up, try as best you can to find a way to leave it set up. Having mm -hmm. to set up and tear down can really limit the opportunities to play games like this. And after too long without playing, it's easy to move on and just never go back. Very true. All right. This kind of overlaps a bit with the last suggestion. My next big suggestion for teens is to get into miniature gaming. This was my second biggest hobby as a teen after role-playing games. Besides my Warhammer campaign, I was also at home painting minis. Um, this ties, again, to having more time. Um, and also another teen problem that I remember clearly is I'm bored. The great part about getting into miniature gaming is there's more to it than sitting down and just playing the game with your friends. It means having an entire hobby you got a whole hobby side of things this is great when your friends aren't around to play you can work rebuild your army list you can customize your miniatures you can paint new minis you can trade with the local community to get the figures you're missing you can work on scenery you can go and check the latest faq you can go online and complain about how they nerfed that tank you just bought last week now, since this is a game recommendation episode, I should probably recommend at least one specific miniature game. And I'm going to pull out one that I don't know if a lot of people know or not. Like I, the, the, the friend groups I have and the people I interact with do know this game, but it's not something that has dedicated stores around the world. 
and that is Gaslands. This is a post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game that uses standard-sized dinky cars, Hot Wheels, Matchbox, Majorette. I don't, I, here's how I'm out of touch. I don't even. I know Hot Wheels are still around because I see those. Cost-wise, all you need to do is pick up the rule book from Osprey, which you can get in PDF if you really want to save money or EPUB. Um, you print out and cut out some templates from that PDF. You grab some six-sided dice and find some dinky cars. That's the only cost. Of all the miniature games out there, this is probably the cheapest to get into. Now, from there, you can still get into the whole hobby thing. You can get into getting custom templates. You can 3D print scenery. You can add little weapons. You can modify your cars. You can paint your Hot Wheels and so on. There is still the entire hobby aspect going on for Gaslands. And just like Google Gaslands tables and be amazed at what people have pulled off. There is a great group on Facebook I'm a member of that is constantly showing their mods. And, oh, it looks so cool. Now, that's one game. There are, of course, a ton of other miniature games out there. Um, what I would recommend if anyone's interested in Warhammer Fantasy is to pick up Underworlds, which is more of a two-player skirmish board game that's card-driven. And if you do dig that, then that could lead you to Age of Sigmar. There's Frostgrave, which is also from Osprey, and similar to the way Gaslands you use in any Hot Wheels, Frostgrave uses any fantasy miniatures you have. So that's good if you already have a bunch of miniatures for, say, D&D &D or whatever, so you don't have to go out and build an army. And then, of course, there's Warhammer 40,000, which was my intro to the genre way back when. Yeah, this is a huge one for people to get into, but it's also a huge amount of time. If you're already a miniature gamer, introducing this gets a lot easier and painting with others can be a, can be great. Of course, you might have to give up some space on your painting bench and share some paints and washes, but it means you'll have more chances to play as well. Now, if you're not already a miniature gamer, then I 100% agree that Gaslands is the way to go, especially if you haven't sold off the old Hot Wheels in a yard sale yet. <laughs> Train people can also probably really get into Gaslands easily as well. The concepts in scenery translate over very nicely, even if your scale and track knowledge aren't quite as useful. So I got to say, playing a game of Gaslands on like a well-done train table could be pretty epic. Uh, next up, I have Psychobabble. Now, I picked this one because teams like to travel in packs and do things together. And I remember the big thing, and the, despite the number of times we say it on the show, the group should split up. I remember when it was me and my friends hanging downtown or getting together at the Windsor Gaming Society or sitting down to do anything, we wanted to do it together. We never wanted to split up and have some of us do one thing while the others did something else. We were a team. We want to stay together. So I wanted to recommend a good high player count game. Now, I also picked Psycho Babble based on how well it's gone over with my kids and some of the younger adults who come out to the barbershop bar events. Now, this is a social deduction game that's for people who don't love social deduction games. This is a great one because it does not require any lying. There's also some interesting stuff where the hidden trader doesn't know they're hidden traders. So you don't get the anxiety of having to play a special role. Now, there are lots of social deduction games out there. Werewolf, The Resistance, Secret Palpatine, blah, blah, blah. Those are all good recommendations, but I put Psycho Babble above them because you want those team friendships to last. And not having to lie to your friends is a good way, to, or having to lie to your friends is a good way to break up a, 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 a friend group, whereas not having to lie to them would be a little better. Now, other social deduction games I think would work. These are all games where lying is not required at all to play our where words, two rooms and a boom and deception murder in Hong Kong. Now, this is one where an adult can kick, th kick things off and either step back and let the youngins roll on their own or try and stick with them through it. Psycho Pabble is a great one to introduce, though, as that therapist role lends itself to the teaching role and allows you to help get the game flowing. Fans of the show know that neither of us are big social deduction fans. What I wouldn't recommend is trying something like Battlestar Galactica, which probably won't resonate with the younger crowd the way it will with those of us older and more familiar with the IP. Yeah, it feels strange to me that Battlestar Galactica is old again. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's old again. Yeah. It was already old. They brought it back. Now it's just old again and no one knows what it is. And, and that, yeah, I, I, uh, this, this is the episode where Mo feels old <laughs> and then looks at himself in the camera with all the gray. And it's like, oh. anyway, sticking with the idea 
of games for bigger groups where everyone can play together. Next, I want to suggest Mr. Lovenstein Presents No Context. Now, this came to mind for a few reasons. Um, six player count being, of course, one of them. But really, the one that stuck out to me is that when I got this game, I didn't get it. And I was like, what, what, is, what is Mr. Lovenstein? I had to Google it. And well, it ends up Mr. Lovenstein is a popular webcomic. And I think this is something that most older teens probably know way about, way more about than I do. But not just that. This is also one of those good, silly, laugh out loud, get people talking games. It's one of those games where you play around and when the round ends, everyone's asking each other questions like, why'd you do this? Why'd you choose that? How was this connection made? What were you thinking about? And those, I think, are fantastic because those are games about making connections and learning how other people think. That makes this a great get to know you game. It's not too serious. And what I like about this one over, say, games like Personal Preference or, you know, What Would You Do? And I'm not going to name any of the adult versions of the What you Would You Do or Who. Um, you don't it doesn't have to get personal. Right. Like you don't have to explain anything. You're like, oh, I just thought the dog looked like this. Or you could go deep and explain your connection to your first puppy and really make a real connection. So that's why I recommended this one. Now, other games, I think, do that whole get to know you thing and you're talking to each other and kind of trying to explain your rationale are games like Ven, Dixit. And while I had to throw Telestrations in here, I don't know how much you'll learn from someone playing Telestrations, but honestly, it's my kid's favorite party game and it's never not been a hit with anyone of all ages. Yeah, the big benefit of this one is that the younger generation knows Mr. Lovenstein more than we do. And that familiarity yeah. of content is great for finding that a connection even across generations. Mm -hmm. You as an older folk may not know the artist, but the game concepts are familiar enough and easy to get across. While knowing the art might add some context for those who know it, it's far from required. And similarly, as someone who has, even as a adult in my 40s, played the adult games that we, we aren't recommending with the next generation older, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's horribly mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Please don't do that to your younger generation. Yes. Yes. Either way. Like, like it's not comfortable on either yeah, side. No, it's, it's just bad all around. All right. I am putting the next one on the list. Actually, the next couple. I, I, you know what? At this point, we're just going to talk about cards, I think, for the rest of the episode because <laughs> we like cards. So, so the next one that came to mind for me was a card game. And then I think my brain got stuck. So I don't know if this is still true, but the, the, during Sean and I's generation, we were growing up. Every single high school kid in Ontario played Euchre at lunch. Or if they didn't play Euchre at lunch, their friends did, and they were being grumpy and refused to play because they were being grumpy and teenagers and needed to be different. Traditional card games have always been extremely popular, um, not just here. I know other, from what I hear down south, it's much more popular to play poker. That, that That's what they're playing in high schools. The thing is, a deck of cards and playing Euchre, Heart, Spades is great and all, but we're a board game podcast where we talk about hobby games. So I am going to throw out Thrones of Valeria because guilds arguing at a table over drinks over who's the most powerful guild of Valeria is a much cooler theme. More importantly, though, this goes back to my high player count suggestions on you've got a bigger group, you want to stick together. This is a trick taking game to play six, but it also works when, you know, you're going out on your first date with someone and it only plays two players. It plays good at two to six players. Though it is best, I will say, at even player counts, especially at four and six playing as teams. Now, other modern trick-taking games to check out include Orem, which is a game where you can't follow suit, The Crew, which is a cooperative trick-taking game, and I'm going to pull this one out just because every time I talk about trick-taking games, someone tells me to play it, and this will just save time. You should check out Skull King, and so should I. Now, this is a tough one. Because I think schools are more and more pushing card games out of the building. Uh, with some, I know, banning them completely due to concerns of gambling and distractions. I suspect we may be moving towards a time when people just don't know these games unless they've been taught at home. So yeah. I encourage parents to play card games with their kids and keep them alive. This one probably relies on starting earlier, though. It's quite possible that if you've gone this long without introducing cards to them, they may pass, preferring other forms of entertainment. All right, 
right. As I said, we're going to stick with card games. So how about one most kids even today, I think, have played? And that is Uno. But let's retheme it to be based on the seven deadly sins with no having to keep track of score and no games that go on forever and ever. That's what you get with the deadlies. This is a hand shed hand shedding game with a seven deadly sin theme, seven players, seven suits, seven cards in each suit and a couple little bonus cards in there with special rules. This game has been a huge hit with everyone who's played, played it with us, including a good number of teens at the barbershop bar. It has proved to be extremely popular. This is one where I teach a group and then they run off with my copy of the game for the rest of the night and play over and over again. And I got to say, this is something that to me would have appealed back then when I was in my late teens, though it is kind of amusing that everyone wants the lust to player token every time we start. And getting back to what Sean was mentioning about some games, it does get a little awkward because we did play a game on the weekend with a mother with her daughter at the table. And the the euphemisms that come up when you're playing <laughs> Lust with someone else did feel a little awkward there. But in general, again, I was more thinking a group of teens playing with each other would be perfectly fine with all of the themes here. Now, other deck shedding games I could also see uh, getting for teens are The Great Del Moody, one of my all time favorites. Um, right now I prefer the deadlies. I gotta say great Del Moody is a good one. Um, it's kind of like an advanced version of president for those who know that game or its other name, which we won't mention, uh, skip bow. And one that I got the recommendation from Sean, actually, I haven't tried it myself is haggis. Now, as opposed to the trick takers mentioned in a previous uh, listing, many households have kept copies of skip go uh, skip bow and uno and similar games around. So this genre of card games is less likely to fall by the wayside. Yeah. Still, though, it might may be up to the adults to show them that while Skipbo may feel a little childish, there are some great games that don't have that feel that are in the same genre. Yeah, I basically called Skip Joe because I hadn't played it until fairly recently. Uh, one thing I just thank you, chat room, for pointing this out. I did say it's a seven player game. It's actually a three to seven player game. Seven is the max. You don't need seven people to play the deadlies. Seven is the max amount. All right. All these card games leads me to the um, most profitable card game in the world out there and something that we were obsessed with in our late teens. And that is collectible card game, specifically Magic the Gathering which still to this day is is going ridiculously well. Like, like it's I, I can't believe the game had this much standing power from its humble beginnings in the 90s to the empire. It is now 30 years now, later. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm shocked, <laughs> like I'm shocked and still new cards coming out, new combos and new meta and everything. And that's it. Similar to miniature painting, uh, getting into collectible card games can very much be a hobby on its own. Now, it doesn't have to be, but most people who get into it are going to worry about collecting cards, playing the stock market that is the the buying and selling of cards, chasing the meta, which for those of you who don't play these kind of games, that's the when a new set comes out, certain combos seem to work better and try to change it. Uh, you're, the whole deck building, one of the big parts of magic is coming up with your deck. Um, practicing using your deck. Uh, nowadays, a lot of that happens through Magic Arena, which is an online version. Then there's taking part in tournaments and local play events and Friday Night Magic, which is something I don't know if any local game store can survive without having Friday Night Magic, it seems like nowadays. Now, the other great thing about Magic is the same thing I mentioned with Dungeons & Dragons, and that is the community that has been created around Magic. You're not going to have to worry about where your kids are going on a Friday night if you get them into Magic. Now, of course, there are many other popular collectible card games out there. Uh, one of the biggest compared to Magic is Pokemon. One of the ones the local game stores tell me is the hotness. What the, the teens are playing here, other than Magic, is Flesh and Blood. And, of course, there's Disney Lorcana, if you can ever find a copy of the game to play. Now, this is something that if you're already into, it's great to share with the younger generation. But I would be hesitant to dive into it in order to connect with them. Unless you're playing purely online, this game is an investment. And the more serious you become, the more it can cost. Now, as someone personally who spent a lot of money when there wasn't even that much to buy, 
I can attest to how easily one can get caught up in the need to keep up and join in the churn of cards. Mm -hmm. Playing with your family and not taking part in tournaments can certainly lessen that need to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, actually, when my dad and I were playing Magic the Gathering together at the end there, um, we would just go buy two sealed starter decks and play each other, just avoiding the whole collector's aspect of the game. And yeah, sure, one deck was probably better than the other, but that is a way you can take part in the game. See, I, can you do that anymore? Because I'm not even sure that's actually an, an option, the way they've well, set it up now. Well, you would have to go to a local store to get land, the yeah. one. Because like Commander seems but, to be the main thing that everyone wants, wants yeah. to play right now. Uh, and that's not something you can just decks, though. Like you can just go buy the preset deck and you I go buy the other preset deck and we can play each other. Fair. So it's kind of different. You can't go buy a random pack and right. just play each other. And I missed that. That that was to yeah, me. That was, that was some I, of the I think fun. they still do tournaments like that. Like I think you can still do seal booster. See, we're even out of touch with magic at this point. Because it's expensive right. and we have got better things to spend our money on. Yeah, exactly. So so Sticking to that, right? So my next suggestion is the obvious evolution um, from that, because, yes, we were obsessed with magic and and we we got into it big. We both, uh, Deanna, more so than me, spent a lot of money on it on the time. She had a better job than I could. Um, we probably spent more than we should. So if you are worried about that collectible, keeping up, having to have the latest cards, um, there is an alternative that uh, the term is coined by Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, but I think everyone's using it now, is living card games. This is a, they call it living because every new expansion adds cards to the set, but you just go buy the expansion and you get all the cards. There's no rares to chase. There's no foils. There's no, you can't pay to win. Buying seven copies of the expansion doesn't make, give you any new or better cards than the person who bought one. Uh, new expansions come out regularly and they give you absolutely everything you need. Now, of all the living card games I've played right now, the recommendation I would give is Marvel Champions. Now, this is a cooperative card game, which is, again, we're trying to stick to less competitive stuff. We want the teens playing together, not against each other necessarily, because you just teen friendships can last forever if you you um, take care of them, I guess. I'm, I'm the word I'm looking for. Nourish them. I don't know. Whatever. I'm going to get sappy here, so we'll stop. Uh, it's cooperative. Pick a Marvel character. Build a deck for that character. So you get that whole deck building, and every expansion adds new cards. And even if you're playing Iron Man from the base set, the latest expansion might have that one card that just makes your deck work even better. You then face off against a villain, and you draw a plot card for them, and you can play solo or a team. Now, while I love Marvel Champions, there are lots of other ones out there. Um, there's Lord of the Rings is extremely popular. Arkham Horror. I hear Arkham Horror is great. If you have a teen who doesn't have a lot of friends or their friends are busy or they're, they, they work night shifts so they don't have people around and they're looking for something solo to play. And of course, there's the game we love to mention on the show, the Adventuria Adventure Card Game, which probably would have been my recommendation if you could easily get the game. And don't forget about uh, Sentinels of the Universe if you happen to be the Supers fan. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, can, you tell we really like card games. Yeah. <laughs> really, there's just something so flexible and comfortable about card and card games in so many forms. I do wonder sometimes if it's something somewhat universal, or if where and when we grew up has colored our love of cards and card games in a specific way. It's possible. And regardless of why, though, if you love cards, why wouldn't you want to pass that on and enjoy it with the next generation? especially when it's not as exp uh, competitively expensive as collectible card games can be. So there you go. Nine specific games called out that were really more calls to genres of games that I think older teens would enjoy mainly playing with each other. Now, of course, there are a ton of other options out there. Like as Sean noted um, at the start, the, the times like by the time a kid's an older teen, they're pretty damn sure about what they like and don't like and can pretty much make up their own minds. So in reality, the question was too vague to really get down to what games specifically we should have recommended, which is kind of why we went with genres, because my suggestion would be way more tied into what the kid's into. As we talked about on our episodes about like hooking new gamers, one of the best ways to do it is to play a game about something they're interested in. Or maybe they love jigsaw puzzles and or or solving deduction and mysteries, and they would like some like escape room style games. 
We know about plenty of those. Or they're like kids that are all, you know, part of the chess club and they like to outplay each other and they like games with perfect information where they can intellectually challenge themselves and their opponents and they're into super heavy euros and maybe an 18xx is the perfect game to get them into what i tried to do is keep these recommendations tonight as broad as possible to appeal to the largest group of teens out there now if you have a specific team you're shopping for feel free to hit me up with more details maybe we can give you a more refined list you can do that by emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Well, there you have it. Our list of games we think would appeal to older teen kids or that you as an adult can play with your older teens. How did we do? Did we pull it off pretending to be teens again or are we way off base? Could you do better? What games would you recommend for older teens or even better if you are an older teen into tabletop gaming? What are you into? And what might you play with older gamers? Let us know in the comment below. Now, if you happen to have your own podcast and, you know, you're you're like around 18 years old, I would love to see you do a list of games to play with the old folk. It's time to take a look at the cutest game in our collection. Boop. Thanks, Kurt from Smirk and Dagger for letting us take a review copy of this one, Home from Origins. Boop is a two-player only abstract strategy game from Smirk and Laughter. It was designed by Scott Brady, who I know from his party game, Hughes and Hughes. Boop is an update and re-theme of Scott's original design, Gekatai. This new cat-themed version features artwork from Kurt Covert, the head of Smirk and Dagger Games. Boop was released in 2022, and since then it has won a number of awards, including the 2023 Mensa Select winner, the 2023 American Tabletop Early Games Gamers winner, and the Origins 2023 Game of the Year. Boop's playtime is very much based on how experienced the players are, but with most games finishing in under half an hour. Now this game is about cats jumping on a bed, which is represented by a 5x5 five five grid. When players place a kitten on the bed, they boop all adjacent kittens one space away. The player can get three kittens in a row, they upgrade to cats. Cats can't be booped by kittens, but can boop other cats. First player to get three cats in a row wins. One of the most standout things about Boop is the components, which you can check out in our Boop unboxing video on YouTube. There you get to see all of the Boop cuteness, which includes a quilted playing grid that you place on the upturned box to form the bed. Eight kittens and cats in two different colors and patterns, and a simple single sheet folded over rule book that does a great job of explaining how to play Boop. All of these components give Boop a fantastic table presence. This game would st have still worked mechanically if it was just a wooden board and some glass beads. This is exactly the type of quality of life improvement we talk about in episode 215, Quality of Life. It's not needed, but great to have. Now, it's also worth noting Smirk and Laughter considers Boop a follow-up to Shobu. So at the end of the review, I am going to spend a little bit talking about the two of those and comparing them. Before that, though, let's talk about how you play Boop, because it's not just tapping kittens on the nose and saying, oh. Start by dumping out the box. Grab the cat and kittens of your color of choice. Separate the kits and cats. Flip the box over and put the quilted board on top to form the bed. The player who last petted a cat starts, or you can choose to start player at random or use Schwazi or whatever. On a player's turn, they're going to add one of their I8 active playing pieces to an empty spot on the board. Now, at the start of the game, this is the eight kittens you have, none of your cats. Now, when a, place, a piece is placed, it boops all adjacent pieces from either player one space directly away. Any pieces booped off the board are returned to their player. Booping does not cause a chain reaction, and you can't boop a piece if the space it would be moved into is blocked by another piece. Whenever someone manages to get three of their kittens in a row, they remove them from the board and swap them for cats. Cats are placed just like kittens and can boop all other pieces. However, cats can't be booped by kittens. If a set of three pieces is later made using a mix of cats and kittens, all of the pieces are removed and any kittens in the mix are upgraded to cats. The first player to get three cats in a row wins the game. You can also win by having all eight of your cats on the bed at once. Finally, there's one exception to the rules. At the end of a turn, if all of your pieces are on the board, you can remove one piece. 
If this piece is a kitten, you get to upgrade it to a cat. Now, for younger players, the rule suggests you leave the cats in the box and just play until one of the players makes a row of three kittens. That's it. They're all, that's all there is to Boop. While it sounds simple enough, you have no idea how hard it is to line up these bouncy felines until you sit down and play a full game. Now, my wife and I love two-player abstract games. We collect these kinds of games and bring them with us for date nights, out to the coffee shop, to play at a pub, or so on. Now, to me, the thing that makes the best kind of two-player abstract strategy game is that it has two qualities. It's simple to learn, but difficult to master. And that's exactly what we found in Boop. Though I have to say here, there are a number of rules here that, while not difficult by any means, you do have to remember. Like lining yeah. up a mix of cats and kittens gives you cats, or using all of your pieces, if not a win, lets you upgrade a kitten to a cat. Those yeah. are the little sorts of rules that you can easily forget and can lead to extreme play. Now, while there are some outliers to the basic gameplay, I got to say that basic gameplay, though, is super simple. Pick a piece, poop other people's pieces away from it, and try to make a line of three. Like, that's really it. The thing is that those simple mechanics lead to really interesting play. It is not easy to line up three pieces in a row because you don't get to make the determination until everything's been booped out of position. It takes a bit to figure out the strategies of how to even do that for the first time. It's interesting, as I've watched this played in public, and remembering which pieces you can and will boop, can and which and you can't boop, with every given placement seems to be a hurdle for some people to get over. While easy, it's not always instinctual, so I think there's a bit of a learning hump to get past. There's nothing hard to overcome, but it does need to be overcome. Now, what Boop that does that really makes it stand out to me is that it takes that core quality of a good abstract game, easy to learn, difficult to master, and ties it to an instantly recognizable theme of cats jumping on a bed, which is then represented by awesome component design and quality. Smirk and Laughter even went so far as to make sure the patterns on the pieces were different for each side, so there's no worry about color-based vision issues. Mm -hmm. Without the cute theme and top-shelf components, Boop would still be a great game. Mm -hmm. The thing is, these extra elements elevate it to be even more. Yeah, because these cosmetic and thematic touches make the game appeal to a broader audience. People often think of chess-like abstract games with wood, stone, and marble pieces and fancy boards to be these kind of high-end intellectual games. Boop turns this tradition on end by presenting a very family-friendly and approachable game that's just as mechanically deep as some of those classier games. They've taken a scary, thinky game and given it a cute wash. Now, with all that said... This is still a two-player abstract strategy game. That's what it is at its heart. That's what the mechanics are. That's not going to appeal to everyone. While my wife and I love this style of game, I know many gamers who prefer to play larger group games who aren't like don't like being limited to two players, or they prefer games that tell a story or there's some kind of advancement or things build over time. You're not going to find any of that here. This is right there with chess, go, or yinch, but cute. Overall. Boop is a fantastic two-player abstract strategy game that also has a super cute and awesome theme with components that match it. I think this is a fantastic way to introduce more people to a genre of game they may have avoided in the past. If you are a fan of abstract games, you really should check out Boop. We get that the theme of cats jumping on a bed may seem a bit silly compared to two armies facing off, but the mechanics here are very solid and winning is not nearly as easy as it first appears. Now, if you've never really given abstract strategy games a shot, maybe even thinking they're too complex or their work not fun, check out Boop. It's a great game, and the theme makes it easier to find willing opponents than other two-player abstract games. If you're looking for an engine-building euro, a thematic dice chucker, or the next innovation in deck building, and don't enjoy the one-on-one -on -one conflict and stress of abstract strategy games where there is no randomness and you have to outthink your opponent, you probably want to give Boop a pass. Now, I will say, though, if you happen to be shopping for someone who loves cats, Boop could be the perfect gift. While it would be great for someone you know who already enjoys abstract strategy games, this could also be a great gateway game for someone who's new to hobby board gaming. At the start of this review, we noted that Smirk and Laughter considers Boop to be a follow-up to Shobu. 
Mm-hmm. While the games are from different designers, they do have similarities and are both two-player only abstract games. I gotta say, on paper, when I describe how to play the two games, or when you listen to reviews of both the games, they do sound quite similar. But I gotta say, once you actually sit down and play them, they both give a very different feel. You're in a different brain space playing each of the two games. Like Boop is all about trying to figure out two moves ahead that when I place this, this is going to move here. It requires a lot more spatial thinking. It's all about lining things up, trying to make ropes. Whereas Shobu is much more confrontational. It's much more take that in your face, more like chess, because it's all about pushing your opponent's pieces as well as protecting yours. So the two actually give a very different feel. While I would say both games would be chess-like abstracts, they are both do the simple to learn, easy to dif- or difficult to master thing, but they're, they're both to me very different games. If anything, I found Shobu to be the easier of the two, not to win, but to yeah. grasp. The singular player pieces without the upgrade path of boot make for an even more easy to grasp game. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, my wife and I have actually found over time, and I know this is a boop review, but we actually prefer Shobu just by a bit. For the two of us playing together, Deanna and I across from each other on a table, we'd have more fun playing Shobu. We find it a little more competitive. It's a little more thinky. It's it's one of those games where you're going to, you know, uh, we just played the other day and Deanna appreciated that I needed to go to the washroom to give her some more time to think, right? The thing is, if it's not just me and her, I am going to grab Boop because it's more approachable and because of its table presence. This is the kind of game I love playing in public because it gets people asking questions like, what are you playing? Is that a game about cats? Is that a bed? I've literally had people say things to me. This is the kind of game that gets strangers playing games at public play events. And it's the type of thing where I'll be at Kava and I'll be like, do you want to sit down and learn how to play Boop? Like, it's just, it's got that table presence. It's interesting, though, as I wonder which would actually get more replay. I suspect that it's easier to get people to play Boop, but it would be easier to get people to keep playing Show Boop. Uh, So far, based on the two public play events I've had where I've had Boop out and um, and Show Boop out, Boop was the one that got played more. More people were picking it up, looking at it and interested in it, which just shows how much that theme matters. But it was usually one game. People would play a game of Boop, and then they were done with it. There was one couple that did two or three games. Shobu, though, seemed to be the same. People would learn it. They wanted to play twice, though. Shobu was always twice because it takes a minute to grok it. Everyone played the first game and be like, oh, okay, now I get it. and want to play that second game. So I don't know. Um, For me, I like having both. But I am also someone who plays two-player abstract strategy games with my wife and hosts public play events. So they each fill a niche. Both of these games are going to get plenty of play, even if it's not always me playing those games. Well, thank you for joining us for this review of Boop from Smirk and Laughter Games. Something you don't see very often, a thematic abstract game with some really fantastic components. A game we hope will get more people to at least try out the abstract strategy game genre. Now, for a bit of a deeper dive into Boop, check out my written review over on the blog. It's live right now. If you have thoughts on this game or abstract strategy games in general, come share them on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord. You can find at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Would love to keep talking about Boop or abstract strategy games there. Join us for a quick look at a kind of gimmicky party game from The Op, Apple. Thanks to The Op for letting us take a review copy of this one home from Origins. Moe's wanted a copy of this one for a long time. So there's more history to this game than I ever realized. So the game we know of as Tapple got its start in the form of Pim Pam Pet, which is a Dutch game where the players get a parameter card and then spin this spinner. And there's a gap in the spinner that would show a letter. You then had to say a word that started with the letter that matched your parameter. And then you would spin again and you try to see how many you could do in a row. Well, a number of different versions of Pim Pam Pet were released. Uh, including card versions and dice versions and so on. There's a whole bunch of these. Eventually, they put out one called Pip Pam Pet the Battle, which was pretty much the game we know today as Tapple. Uh, so the Tapple name comes from USA Opoly, who brought the game to North America in 2013 in the form of what is now considered 
Tapel English First Edition. Now, similar to the game it's based on, Tapel uh, then spread itself around the world. I'm um, spanning various editions. The the French and Swedish versions happen to be called Last Letter Standing. Over in the UK, it's called Think Words. Well, the version we actually have in our hands, which you can see behind me here, is the latest English version, which was just re-released and updated in 2021, generally called the English Edition 2021. Now, while each of these versions changed up things like the card contents and the color of the letter disc, the basic gameplay has remained the same since 2013. Now, this latest edition of Tapple is listed as playing 2 to 10 players, age 8 and up, with a playtime of 30 minutes. While there's theoretically no reason you couldn't play more with 10, like I'm not quite sure where they pulled that number out of, it does get hard to cram every around the table around the little Tapple wheel so they can reach it to play. And yes, you can pass it, but once you get to a large group, that becomes more difficult. The Tapple is a mass market game, so you can find it at pretty much any large department store, toy store, as well as hobby game stores, and most online shops. It has an MSRP of $21.99 US. Now, Tapple is basically a mashup of traditional word games type. Uh, you probably grew up playing and played in English class and stuff like that, and Hot Potato. You get a category, then you have 10 seconds to come up with a word that matches that category, then it goes to the next player who has to come up with a different word with a different first letter. And what happens in this that makes it more of a game and where the tapple wheel comes in is that it tracks what letters have been used and has a built-in timer. That's all tracked on the wheel. For a look at this wheel and some of the category cards that come in the latest edition of this word-based game, check out our tapple unboxing video on YouTube. It's worth a watch just to see how Moe's memory of the game didn't quite match the reality yeah. of it. It was close. I, I swear somewhere I, I played a mechanical version of Tapple that like mechanically clicked. I swear that exists. I right? had a total Mandela effect going on here for me on this one. Now, a couple of things that are important to know here that I learned during the unboxing. Um, for one, this game batteries are not included. This is a battery powered board game. Um, you, you don't get batteries. Two, once you get the game open, the plastic word wheel has a slot underneath that holds all the cards. So everything you need is held in the gimmicky toy thing, which is pretty cool. So there's actually no reason to keep the box here. unless you're someone who's a collector and needs the box on your Calyx, you just keep the wheel. Now, Tapple is a dead simple game to learn. You start by taking the category cards out of the bottom of the wheel. You turn it on and flip it over. If any letters are pushed down, reset the wheel by pinching the letter release lever which for some reason there are five of, so you can pick any one of those. I still find a little odd. Now the start player, uh, technically the player whose middle initial is closest to A, takes the top card from the deck and picks one of the four categories on it to be the, the, the clue for that round. These are actually color-coded based on difficulty, with one side of the card better suited for younger players. Now the current player announces the category aloud, taps the timer in the middle of the wheel. They then have 10 seconds to name something that matches the category that starts with an available letter on the tapple wheel. Once they have it, they say it, they push down the matching letter and tap the timer. Now it's the next player's turn to come up with a different word using a different letter, hitting the letter and then the timer when they have one. Timer runs out, meh, you're eliminated for the round. Next player in player order taps the timer and continues playing until one person's left. The last player standing wins the round and takes the category card. Then, a new round is started and played the same way. The game ends when a single player has collected three category cards. That's the basics. Uh, like most simple games, there are a couple of additional rules in there for outliers and situations that may come up. Uh, this includes the fact that a player is eliminated if they say a word that doesn't match the category, which if it's up for vote, uh, you put it up for vote. If players don't agree, the majority decides if you're here or not. Or if you hit the wrong letter, this one's important. This has come up in many games I've played where people say one thing and then miss or hit the wrong thing. You are eliminated for hitting the wrong letter. Saying xylophone and hitting Z is going to get you in trouble. <laughs> yes. uh, and then there's overtime. If all the letters get pressed during a round, a new round is started with the remaining players. A new category is drawn and each player has to say two answers on their turn instead of one. If those players somehow get through it again, you do it again. But this time, you're going to have to name three things. And now you'll have three category cards in play. So in both of the overtime forms, 
the person who wins actually gets to take both of those. So technically, if you win a game in double overtime, you just won that entire game at Tapple. Well, there you go. You now know how to play Tapple. Go forth and spread the Tapple joy to others. Now, now I'm sure there's some people sitting here going, why are you talking about Tapple? Like, this is a pretty popular mass market game that most people have at least heard of or seen on the store shelves. Well, the thing is, it's a really solid high player count game that is great for catching people's attention. Now, I first played Tapple many years ago at our first ever Windsor Extra Life event, way too early in the morning. And I have been meaning to pick up a copy ever since. I just never got around to it. So when we were at Origins and we're meeting with the op and we're hanging out and they are showing off this awesome new game called The Art Project. Look forward to that. It looks really cool. I noticed they had Tapple on the shelf behind them. And I asked if it would be cool with us grabbing a review copy. And they said yes. So did the game live up to your memory of it? Uh, yeah, pretty much, except for the fact that I remember it being mechanical and now electronic. The gameplay was exactly what I remembered. Now, when we did play the first time, if I remember, we left the category cards in the box and we were just making up our own stuff based on whatever, Doctor Who, um, whatever, uh, Doctor Who actors or something. Um, but most importantly, what the game did is exactly what it did at 3 a.m. on Saturday night during Extra Life. It, it had that effect. It, it brought people out of their shells it got people talking it got people playing games i brought this out to a barbershop bar event and it was everything i wanted it to be that is the reason i'm talking about tapple i am mainly talking about tapple for those of you looking for games to bring to public play events this is the kind of game that catches people atten people's attention it gets people wondering what's going on first off the toy like look at that thing you see that thing and you're like, what the heck is this? And you want to touch it every time I brought this out to a game event and put it with the pile of games. It is the most picked up thing. Whether people go back to a table with it or play is a different thing, but they at least look at it like the thing looks like a letter Frisbee and possibly a deadly weapon. Second, as a typical electronic toy, it's loud. You can't help but hear the ticking and especially the buzzer when it goes off. Third, the people who are playing it tend to be even louder than the game. People are screaming out words. They're cursing when they can't think of a word. They cheer when a player gets a word at the last second. The players who are eliminated tend to pick favorites out of who's left and chair for people. There's there's booing. There's umming and awing. It's, it's great. This can turn into quite the rowdy party game that draws a crowd. Amusingly, aside from Mo mentioning it fondly from time to time on this show, I had never heard of Tapple. Now, likely I had seen it probably on the shelves at stores from time to time, but it certainly never registered on my mind in any way. So this is the kind of game that catches people's attention, has them looking over and coming over to see what the, pars, the, the fuss is. And one of the great things about this, is how quick a round is, is that person can be just tossed into the game for the next round so easily. This is a great opportunity to invite people to get involved and play at public gaming events. One of the things I love about public play events is I tend to have them in a place where there's gamers and non-gamers, and it's the way to get those non-gamers to become gamers. That's why I've wanted my own copy of Tapple for years, and I am so happy I have a copy now. Really is perfectly suited to those public play hosted events. Well, assuming that the volume and language aren't <laughs> a problem. It might be an issue at a quieter location or one where dropping an F-bomb as the timer goes off on you is frowned upon. There is something else we've talked about session zero for board games before. Um, depending on who you're playing with, you might want to have a conversation about what kind of words will be allowed. Now, all that said, right, I, I got what I wanted. I like like that part's definitely positive. Tapple did exactly what I, I wanted it to do. It, it, it's a great game for bringing out to public play events, but it surprised me. What surprised me is how much my own family has enjoyed playing this kind of silly gimmicky party game, this very toyetic thing. Now, I got it for public play, but my kids love playing this game. They must have played seven, eight, maybe 12 rounds in a row the first time I brought it out with them. Now, yes, they had fun playing with the family and everyone playing, but then they took it up to the room and did the two player thing where they were trying to challenge each other with categories and coming up with stuff they're into, right? These are a couple teen girls who are going involved playing Tapple to come up with who knew more magic spells or who knew more Pokemon or who knew all the more warrior cats. That's a tie in with the episode theme of tonight. This was a great game for my teens. 
So once I understood what the game was, I realized it's quite similar to an old campfire game I knew. The difference mm-hmm. being, since you couldn't really have the device at a campfire, you just use the last letter of the previous guess as your required first letter. And that was how you prevented word reuse. Yeah, basically that's what it is. It's that hot potato with a, a nice toy for tracking things. So, well, I wanted a game to entertain big groups of public play events and hopefully draw some new people in. I got that. I also ended up with a quick to learn, easy to understand, fast playing party game that my own family greatly enjoys. Winning all around, it turns out, just goes to show that not everything that's mass market is necessarily a bad game. It's True. more about finding the right times and places for such games, assuming they really are games, but that's not a problem here. Now, that's a lot of praise, right? But Tapple is obviously not for everyone. Uh, the biggest problem with this game is it can be anxiety inducing. This is a real time game where you have to think on your feet. This is the kind of game that stresses people out. If you have anxiety issues, you probably are not going to enjoy Tapple. It's not going to be a game for you. Heck, the timer ticking away with your mind goes completely blank just trying to think of something like crayon colors can get to me. So I fully understand that it's not going to be for some players. If you're the kind of person who freezes at getting anything else done while you're waiting for the microwave or blanks out when people turn to you for an answer in a meeting, this might not be for you. Now, if you don't mind the stress of real time games and like high player count party games, I don't think you'll go wrong with Tapple. Just make sure you pick up some batteries at the same time you grab the game. And do mind your language around the kids. Now, if you don't dig real time games or don't like party games or hate being put on the spot or don't like word games, there's lots of reasons here to dislike Apple. Uh, you probably aren't listening right now, but yeah, it's it's not going to be for you. It's really that simple. It's a fun real time world game. If that's your thing, grab it. If that's not your thing, move along. Personally, I'm super happy I got a copy. I've wanted it forever. And while it didn't quite work the way it did in my memory, I'm still going to keep searching for the mechanical version of Apple. Maybe I saw a prototype. I don't know. But it perfectly fit the niche I intended it to fit and then ended up being better than expected for my own group and family. So bonus. Well, that's it for our review of Tapple, a real time mass market party game that we think is great for big group game nights and public play. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for new games to bring out to our local events. What's a game you would recommend that's great at catching people's attention and potentially hooking a new player? Let us know in the comments. Now, I also invite you to check out my written review of Tapple when it goes live over on the blog. For those of you catching the audio version of this review, it should be there now over at tabletopbellhop.com. Finally, if you'd enjoyed this review and the other content we produce, please consider tipping the bellhop by heading to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now in the Bellhop's Tabletop, we look back at the games we played since the last episode. So we're still on hold here in regards to the basement. So any gaming I've done has had to be out of house. Thankfully, last weekend was one of our barbershop bar game nights. So that worked. Um, It started off slow. Plays started to fill up as the night went on. And we ended up with a pretty good crowd by the end of the night. I got to say what was really nice to see was a number of new people who hopefully will come back, um, including we met a couple of Bellhop podcast fans. So that was awesome. Mo's been a fixture in Windsor Gaming now for quite some time, and he is the Tabletop Bellhop. I'll know we really made it when I get recognized by people I haven't already been gaming with for years. Yeah, that's true. You haven't been called out yet. That's that's, that's true. So in this case, it was an audio podcast person. So Mm -hmm. once I introduced you, she's like, there, I do recognize (laughs) that voice. I just need to bring this voice out to the game. (laughs) Yeah, so you have to start talking like that while we're playing games. Now, as for the games played, uh, finally, introduce Sean to Kapow. We played one game with the base uh, set and then one game with the volume one heroes uh, or sorry, hero and villain. Um, What was fun about this one is we were playing. It really caught people's attention, like more than it has in the past. And people came over and were like watching. And I'm like, well, I paused the game and went over to the table and grabbed volume two and set it up for them. Um, And and another pair of people, I don't want to say couple because they weren't together, but another another set of gamers started playing right next to us. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, what I did is I left up what I meant to do was then set up a team game with the four of us. But then I don't remember what I got distracted doing, but I was teaching or something. I got pulled away. Now, I've talked about Kapow, I think, three episodes in a row now. So, Sean, you haven't spoke to this one at all. So what do you think? I thought you'd like this one. So, I mean, first off, the theme is right on market for me. 
Yeah. Uh, look at me. I'm playing a superhero game. That's not going to go wrong. Uh, the concept in the game of the game is really strong. Uh, the growth of characters, the difference in characters is great. Um, my big disappointment is one that you've mentioned in the past, but it really kind of, you know, actually feeling it happen um, was a, a disappointment. And that is the physical product letting them down, uh, yeah. both with the exchangeable dice, which a number of times as I'm rolling, pieces are falling off. Um, and then also their DM screen doesn't actually fit the game. It doesn't block the, like, like, it's one thing that it that it doesn't block when you add in the the extra card. It doesn't it doesn't block when you add in the fourth fold of mm-hmm. the for the advanced game. But it doesn't even block out the whole threefold game. Um, and I I mean yeah, it, it has all the information you need. I their DM is yeah informationally that DM yeah. screen is fantastic. It really is. It's all you need. Yeah. But it it doesn't block what you want it to block. And that is a strange choice to have made. So that one didn't bug me at all. It bugged Deanna a lot too. So it's, so I guess I'm the odd man out. (laughs) Not, it it just, I I don't know. Like, it's not like I could see your board. It blocked it vision wise, but it just doesn't, it doesn't fit wrap around. (laughs) Yeah. It just, it just doesn't feel like it should. Yeah. Yeah, It didn't bug me at all. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to say about the, the, yeah, the dice, I don't know. Maybe the I dice thing is really problematic. Wise though. Wizards website and see if they have suggestions. What I would like to do is, like I said, I, I think it's specifically one die and one side, but I think there might be a second die that's bad. But like, there's one particular die on one side, and I just think I need to mark it some way. Like, grab a permanent marker, yeah. a white paint marker, and mark that side. And first off, just tell people fill that last. Like, like you assume the dice are random. You're going to have to buy an awful lot of upgrades to need to use. Like, first off, don't even touch that die. Leave that one in the box until it's the sixth one drafted. And then again, don't put anything on that side until it's the sixth side of the sixth die you're filling. I don't think that'll come up that often. And my other thought is to throw some blue tack in there. Yeah, I I mean, maybe I got I got I had bad luck, but I mean, I, you know, a number of times it fell off for me in that in in that game. And and that was that was frustrating because, again, you don't was that the did it fall off the, the the side that is up did it fall off you know you never necessarily even know where it's from mm-hmm. you don't want to be cheating but at the same time you also don't want to lose out on the fact that things what you might have got your dice yeah. So. yeah that's a huge disappointment and and i don't think we like i'm pretty sure we had the retail version like, i don't think this was a prototype that yeah. this was a finished product they were selling at origin so unfortunately i don't think it's like we can say it'll be improved I, what i need to do is check board game geek like before we do the final review i think i'll check board game geek i'll check wise wizards see if there's any suggestions anything they've said maybe they have a, a quick and easy die replacement program because it only affects 10 percent of dice i don't know it'll be interesting to know um did some you know schmoozing talking to people teaching games handing out games um then i decided to do something i don't do often which is sit down to play a longer game and sat down and we tried to figure out seas of havoc um, though figuring it out makes it sound way harder than it was because very clear rule book, very concise rule book, um, a lot of rules, an awful lot of rules, but they all just kind of work. Um, there was some rule referencing and there were a couple things we Googled, but every time we Googled it, like the answer was what we thought it should be. Like nothing felt out of place. Uh, did a four player game. We used the suggested captain and ship pairings. Um, what I didn't realize that in the book, they're listed in order of difficulty and two of us took like the bottom ones that were the hardest to learn. So next time I teach the game, I'm going to use different ship pairings for new players. Um, played with, um, Sean and Sean and Steve and myself, um, some Hamiltons and some not, um, I, I don't know, like, like something about that game, like turn one, I was in, I'm like, no, I I'm, I'm digging this. Like. Like I could tell from the rules I was going to dig it and then doing it. I'm like, yep, that, that feels like I thought it would. Um, but the, like the weird thing is just, there's so much going on in that game. Like, like, it, like it feels, I don't know, Gloomhaven level is probably too much, but it feels like the weight's way heavier than it is. Like when you, when you talk about all the things you'll be doing, all the things you have to watch and track, it seems very overwhelming. Cause like, this is a worker placement game where you've got three workers. Um, there's some weird special placement rules. For, for some of the characters. So there's that to watch for. 
there's placements you take where you steal things from other players or not. So like there's even weird, like, it's not just collect resources. Then there's a the resource management. You've got three things to track. Two of them are limited. You can only hold so many, a third's not, right? So that's another thing you have to keep in your head. Then it's a deck builder. You've got your starting cards and you're going to buy new cards. And the cards have power-ups that go with flags. So you got to think about the combinations of those. And do you stick with all one flag or not? And then there's three types of cards. There's movement, pivots, and cannons. And some cards that do multiples. And like, like there's a whole bunch going on there. And then all of that's tied to a, tried, uh, a card-driven naval war game. Like it's just so much going on. Yeah, I mean, I want to play this more. I want to try more captain ship combos. I like this immensely, despite no interest <laughs> whatsoever in naval war games. Like none. You say, hey, you want to play a naval war game? And I will look at you strangely and wonder if there's something coming out of my head. If someone is like <laughs> stuck at a, a, a ship's captain's hat on me or something because why would you ask me that question and yet this game absolutely captured my interest it was yeah. really good mm -hmm. yeah I, I i was i was shocked by how well it played i i think a good see scene was we had a miniature war gamer in the group someone who would be into naval war games and their only complaint was the game was way too short which fits because they wanted to play an epic three hour, whereas this is actually a pretty quick playing. Like it's not quite filler level, but like I, I have no doubt that you could finish a game in an hour once yeah, everyone was, knew the game. I was surprised. I, they were talking about how it, had, it was uh, it didn't feel long enough. And for me, it felt really right. Like yeah, the length was just right. So that last round, man, the, the, the end can can surprise you. It can creep up on you. And that happened other games i played too um the only bad part i found having now played it uh, another time which i'm going to talk about more later is with four the only thing i found is it kind of felt like no matter what you did you could shoot someone like like it wasn't really hard to get in some position to get some points so it just seemed a little too easy i absolutely adored the asymmetry everyone knows i like asymmetry but man this game like takes it to a new level like it it was a surprising amount of asymmetry here. Stuff we didn't realize. Like I actually thought the six starter cards for every ship were the same, but the upgrade cards were different. No, those six starter cards are different too. And the upgrade cards are different. And the two cards that the captain adds to the deck and the captain's ability. And the fact you can swap the captains. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, the asymmetry was so wildly deep. It, it really felt like we were playing not different games, but completely different paths within the game mm -hmm. the required strategy for these different combos was wild because mo was saying where you you know you couldn't move uh without taking a shot except i literally could not shoot for the yeah. first half of the game nothing in my deck allowed me to fire cannons until i bought a card that allowed me to mm -hmm. fire cannons um yeah. and that was just bizarre because there was another player at the tip who almost all they could do was fire cannons and they could fire a lot of cannons uh -huh. and yet other than uh you know mistakes that were made <laughs> later in the game it was still balanced like yeah it, it you know other yeah you know, again we made mistakes because there were things we didn't understand some of us mis misunderstood rules and and that put us into positions where the end game may have come out that it, although it also turned out we played extreme uh, yeah, which, which was a different uh, a different thing. But, you know, up until some of those mistakes, despite this wildly varied starting position, it felt balanced. Yeah, it worked really well. We, we, we messed up a couple of rules at the end of the game, something we missed, minor rules that we missed in the instructions. So so I'm going to I'm going to pause right here and say, welcome some fork. It ends up we have the designer of Seas of Havoc in our chat room right now. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you for joining us. I don't know if you've been here for all episode. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you had, if you just joined us or you had good timing. So thank you very much for stopping in. Um, so again, these are first thoughts at this point, we've only played once. Um, the other thing that shocked me here was the replayability. Uh, besides little things like randomly generating the board and, and everyone's going to take different actions and it is a deck builder. You're going to buy different cards. Just the fact there were six captains and six ships without any expansions, and you compare them up in any possible combination, that is a huge, 
number of combinations. I, I tried to do the math in my head. It's been too long since statistics, but I think it's 720 possible combinations. I, I might be off on that. I can't remember if it's six to the power of six or six factorial for that one. It's been too long. I have to ask my daughter who took stats <laughs> more recently. She's already in bed. Yeah, no, this was this was just fantastic. Uh, the achievement sheets that, w- that yeah. uh, we found when you were doing the unboxing makes so much more sense. Yeah. Now, having played it once, uh, I want to start, you know, racking up some of those achievements because I, I want to try these different combos. Uh, I just happened to play the completely non-confrontational merchant with yeah. a trading vessel um, and and enjoyed, even though everyone else was happily going around blowing up other ships, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the fact that I could go scrap up some money and, and do all sorts of fancy things having the money that other players couldn't do. Yeah, your whole character was all about buying cards that are worth points, really. Mine was about controlling the flags, which I could have done better. Um, plus, we, again, played the one character's ability wrong where they shouldn't have been able to steal flags. So that would have changed things up. But, yeah, I, I, I really impressed. What I want to do is I'm, I'm having the stupid I bought a new notebook thing. <laughs> I don't want to write on my achievement sheet because right. I hate writing on games, although I love it in a legacy game. Like, I, I don't know, but. I'm like, I need to find a PDF of that. It's got to be out there. I'm sure we can get a PDF on board. Well, I mean, we can just scan it and print a copy. You know, we can just or scan it. Yeah, I just, I just, I'm, I'm like, I've been loath to actually start. Plus, you know, it's it was our first game, right? So one of the bellhops' laws is the first game you play will be played extreme, and sure enough, it was. Yep. So I hate counting those anyway on on something like an achievement sheet. Yeah, yeah. I, I log it as a play. But. It would be interesting. It would be interesting to know how many less points uh, somebody would have gotten if they had realized yes. that they couldn't bonus every single shot they fired from the ship of the line yeah Yeah, and as as dan is pointing out too even the achievements were asymmetrical so that that was pretty cool and it's every captain with every ship um so continuing on barbershop bar we still have more gaming we will get back to seas of havoc in a moment um we ended the night playing the deadlies um with a big bellhop fan and her daughter so that was awesome Uh, whose daughter is also named gwen so that was kind of cool um we had uh sean and steve not this sean and had a great time um i gotta say the best part was meeting a fan it's not often i meet a fan and can sit down and play a game with them right other than I've the met- ones who uh, we play with all the time you know every well, yeah month. other than my friends <laughs> there's a bunch of there's a bunch of people who are, we, we count as fans and play with all the time because well they're fans yeah. of us because they know us yes there is that like roger is a fan of the show but i was gaming with roger before I had a podcast as an example. This was awesome. Often I met fans. I met fans while playing ping pong. I met fans at the trampoline park with my kids, but it wasn't the kind of thing where it was a gaming place where I could play with them. So that was awesome. That that was memorable to me. Um, as for the deadlies, again, Smirk and Dagger, Uno for gamers, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, it continues to be very popular, um, proving to be popular with gamers of all ages. Science shined at all player counts. Three. I haven't gotten to play seven yet. Three to six. Um, almost reviewed that one tonight. Uh, it was really close. Uh, the thing, I, the only reason I did is I didn't want to do two Smirk and Dagger games in the same night. I decided to spread them out. We're going to share the the Kurt Covert love over multiple episodes. So we're probably saving that one for next week. But like, I don't know, unless somehow I fit in a game of Deadlies that completely bombs. Um, that's what I was hoping to be able to play with Kat and Tori at Lot 10, or if we can figure some way to get together was to play this. I, it's going to be a positive review. The Deadlies is really good. Yeah, I mean, I've only played it uh, well, more. I can't do it once. One one occasion, multiple uh, multiple plays of it in uh, in Columbus. But it was just, I mean, we cracked it open and started playing, and it was that easy. It was just yeah. a fun collection game, and the fact that there's no scorekeeping really yes. makes it so much more approachable and easy to play and fun to without having to worry about that score looming in front of you, even though you know who's, you know, who's on the path to win. Uh, it, not keeping score just makes it a little more fun. And you don't get those rounds that go on for everywhere and everyone's got a huge mug. You throw in that the 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 greed and the gluttony and uh, the envy to be able to, you know, pass things around. And then, of course, the halo. Right. So like there's always that shoot for the moon ability that even if everyone's got 12 cards each, there's a chance someone could go out that round. So the game's extremely well done. That's another one where we weren't going to take it home. We're at Origins. We weren't even going to we weren't even going to. I was happy with Boop, you know, (laughs) and then Kurt's like, no, no, grab this, too. And thanks, Kurt. Uh, only other gaming this past week. Again, we had basement flooding, right? Not a lot of gaming going on in my house right now. 
is Deanna and I got ourselves an early Christmas gift. So we have mentioned Banded Goose Brewery and Jack Castro Pub and the various places out in Kingsville many times. Uh, Banded Goose Brewery makes some of the best local beer around, and we have been long-term fans of the place. And one of the things they have offered for years is a mug club, which Sean will probably remember back when we were at the second club. Everyone had their own mugs, and you got a fuller, bigger mug of coffee for the same price as anyone else. Same deal, right? These big, nice ceramic mugs. Um, they finally opened up. They they basically put out a call for, hey, if you're a Mug Club member and you're not coming out, maybe we'll buy you out, right? We'll buy your mug back. And then they decided to expand it by I don't know how many people, but they added new mugs. And um, thankfully, we go there a lot and they know us well. So they let us do it online. Normally, you have to show up to get your mug. But the I, I'm forgetting her name right now. I would give her props if I could remember her name. Amanda, maybe. Um, thank you for letting us do an online order and we got our mugs. So one of the things they do as part of the mug club is they have a Sunday mug club social the last Sunday of every month. And that was last Sunday. So we actually checked it out for the first time. Now, being Deanna and I going out to the county, we did make a couple of stops. We stopped at Miller's Bakery, awesome bakery in Kingsville, had some breakfast there. Then we headed over to the Red Lantern Coffee Co., which Sean knows well, where we broke out Seas of Havoc. So this time it's just Deanna and I, and we're sitting down and we're going to play two player. And I'm I'm debating. Deanna's never played the game. Um, basically knows nothing about it. it like like I don't. <laughs> she saw the demo. We kind of saw it Origins, but even then, that it was more it interested me more than her. Um, and I'm like, okay, so we could just play two player, and I could just teach her the game, and then we'll have our learning game, and I'll have tried it two player. The book strongly recommends that you use the 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 Alternative rules, the the I can't remember the title of the section, but the the additional rules when playing two players, and that is doing it with ghost ships. And when playing ghost ships, it also recommends you should try the team mode, so a cooperative game. So that's what we did. We tried the two player cooperative game on normal mode with two ghost ships, which I was a little worried because that's when not only learn the game, but also learn how the AI and everything works. So we did that. And I've got to say, I, it went pretty well. So but, I just want to make a, a quick call out, uh, some fork in our chat room. The designer of the game says, uh, if you're interested in reading, uh, to know more about the background on the game, they've got a recent designer diary on board game geek. And we'll throw a link to that in the notes. Yeah. We'll throw that in the show notes. Which you can find that I forget. We say it at the top of the show. dot com slash episode two one nine. There you go. Thank you. Sean always calls that out. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. So, what impressed me the most about this was this was an AI where I never felt like I had a decision to make, and I never questioned what I should be doing. This was a uses a deck, and during the island phase, you basically flip it over. And it shows a spot on the board and it places a skiff there. And then there's rules to what happens when they go to each one. Most of the time they take resources. Now, you also deal a hand to each ghost ship. And when you get to the sea phase, you flip over to the top card of their, their hand deck and do what it does. Do what it shows. Um, and it was interesting because the maneuvers are based on how much total sales they have. So if they have low sales, they tended to do a small move. But if they built up a bunch of sales, they did a big move. Um, each card then has like three ships on it to match the, cause there's six characters, six colors in the game. Well, if the ghost you're moving matches that you then do an extra ability and that like recreated the asymmetry and the special cards and the abilities that you see when you're playing, uh, humans, stuff like drawing extra cards, stealing resources, taking first player, stuff like that. That's fantastic. When even the AI system keeps that asymmetry and and that yes. the 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 variation in the game because that's really what I felt was some of the strongest portion of the game was the fact that you're all playing the same game but you're all playing it completely differently. Yeah. Now what I didn't notice and was probably there now that you mention it is if like the red ship did the things the red ship would do or if it was completely random like when we were playing again it was a teaching game with Deanna it was when we're each managing one AI so I, I just like I did what it said. I don't remember noticing if, you know, whatever the blue, the blue ship drew more cards or discarded more damage cards that might have been in there, too. Or it might have just been rep repeated like on this card, the red draws a card on this one. The blue draws a card and this card. The yellow draws a card um, system just worked really well. But 
it was a dumb AI, right? Anytime you use a card driven AI, sometimes what the opponents did was pretty pointless or silly. Um, though I will say the first two phases, they seemed extremely smart and um, hit us a lot. And, and we're wrapping the first corner of the board by the end of turn two, um, which at first I'm like, wow. And Deanna's like, what the heck? This AI is going to trounce us. And what didn't click in at first is, is they don't improve, right? Like they collect resources, but like they're not unlocking ship abilities. They're not adding new cards to their decks. They're always using the same deck. So they start off tough, but they stay at that same level at the whole during the game. So the feel I got was uh, they're here. And then we went here and eventually we're above them by the end. But if they did too much damage at the beginning, you don't have enough time to compensate. So I thought that was really well done. Now I will say, Looking at the board stay at the end of the game, it looked close. But then once we added in all our end game scoring, all our points for cards we bought, all of the other stuff at the end, and then removed their damage, it was not close at all. So I would say I found the co-op play, at least, I, again, with the captains and ships combos that we used, and Deanna and I playing together, we found it a little easy. Now, thankfully, the game does include rules for using three ghost ships, and if I ever play it again, two-player co-op, I would throw in three ghost ships. Oh, but no. it's a two-player co-op game. What I'd really rather do <laughs> is play four or five players. Yeah, I mean, again, I, we played it at four, and that was fantastic. I'm interested to see, you know, what happens if you get all six in there. Or can you do six five. or is it only five? Yeah, it's five. Oh, it's so there's five. always, there's always one, one out. Always one out. Kind of interesting. Which is, well, and that makes more sense, too, because you you get the, the variety of... of mix and match in there and and you you're not you're not always going to have uh the matchups if you were to play six every time they'd always be teams so that's great i I think it's fantastic the way it works out there and again the fact that i got interested in a naval combat game yes. is enough is is one that's of those funny. things it's, it's like it's like you and social deduction right oh mm -hmm. my god there's a social deduction game mo likes well oh my god there's a naval combat game that sean's interested in there we go see see my my like I won't say love. I'm not hardcore into it. Of naval battle games, goes back to Games Workshop's Man of War. I really enjoyed Man of War back in the day, and I'm like Man of War with a deck builder. <laughs> ah, there you go. If it was spaceships, you probably would have been all in right from the start. There you go. Yeah, I gotta say, um, my thing that I really want to try, and what we what, what I thought was better this way than when we played four players, was the team aspect. There was just some neat stuff with my teammate getting in my way or this turns this way and you do this and you're like, Why, why'd you move there? Now I can't shoot him. You're in the way. And, and I actually found that really enjoyable. And I think that would also remove that chaos that I said was in the original where it kind of felt like as long as you had shooting cards, you could maneuver easily to shoot someone. Once you got down to team play, it was a lot more strategic and trying to get into position. Like there were. There were definitely like two turns where no one shot anyone, but we could have shot each other because we were, right. you know, near each other in each other's way. But you can't in the game. You, you Well, <laughs> to be fair, certain special abilities like the rockets uh, will hit teammates. But in general, you don't fire cannons to hit teammates. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think knowing knowing more about the asymmetry of the game and the differences, uh, I would probably play differently. Um, oh, yeah. again, you know, there was, there was so much we didn't understand, you know, as we, when we first, ju uh, first jumped in there, um, uh, knowing that I had gotten the one character who was a pacifist, yes, um, basically. I, I would have done things way. differently. And also, again, you know, I messed up on some of the movement rules. I didn't understand a couple of things here and there and, and remembering that the board wraps around, that's a yeah, big that's, one that you need yep. to kind of keep reminding yourself is that, oh, they can shoot you even though they're up there because the board wraps around uh, and mm -hmm. things like that is a, is a big deal that uh, means, you know, while as much as I enjoyed it, we got a lot of things wrong and I'm looking forward to trying it again and yeah. getting things right. Yeah, because at this point, I played the game twice. Sean's played once. So we are, we are a ways off from our final thoughts. Uh, again, we try to play games multiple times where we give our final thoughts and we like to play them with different people. So I want to try this one with Gwen. I'm not sure, Jen, that again, there's a lot of moving parts in this game, though they all work together. There's a lot of moving parts. It may be too much for my youngest. I think my older will oldest will enjoy it. 
um, would love to play this Tori and Cat. I think Tori will love this for some reason. Something the theme, I think, will get into it. So we'll see. We'll see what we can try to uh, get this game played a bit more. Thankfully, it's out and about, so it's we, not need, stuck we need to get a, we need to get a pirate on uh, on his shoulder or a, a pirate there you, uh, on his shoulder. Yeah. There you go. Be good for good for uh, images. Uh, so uh, again, we were going to a mug club social, right? So this is just like the game we played to kill some time before that started. Uh, we got to the not so social social. Um, six people attended, which kind of shocked me because like over a hundred people have these mugs. I just thought this was going to be like the whole place would be rented out and it'd be like cocktail party with all these people walking around with mugs. And I was told there were appetizers, but I was picturing like trays or, you know, go up to the bar and get an appetizer. And that wasn't it. So what it was, was there were tables reserved for us at the beginning. There were three couples that includes us. And we all sat at our own table. Now we got there first. So it wasn't us being antisocial. It was the other people showed up after and did not sit with us. So, oh, well. We got our new mugs. They're awesome. They're nice, hefty. Like I shared pictures. They had really pretty mugs. Uh, we got to try some new beers because they had at least three new beers there. Um, the appetizer was fantastic. Um, the first round and the appetizer were included. So, of course, to support the venue, we had to get another round. Um, and we played some Shobu. Um, Shobu's great. Like I, I'm still loving it. Um, a table that weren't the mug club who joined later. Man, was the dude sitting eating his food very interested in what we were doing. We were, we we're getting the doing over there. Um, had a good time playing that. Played twice. I am really good at the middle game of Shobu. But man, I, I stink at fin it's like chess. I'm the exact same in chess. I can play chess really well, but I don't know how to end a game. I don't know finishers. And I felt that way playing Shobu. I, I I would clear two boards except for one piece on each of hers. Meanwhile, I've got three left everywhere and she'll end up winning because I just couldn't bring home the bacon and get that last piece. And every time I lost through a stupid mistake, I'm too busy trying to get that last piece off, not paying attention to my last piece on a different board. So, yeah, I still haven't. I show fun, but I still haven't played it enough to really sort of develop strategies and figure yeah. out where my holes are and, and, and things like that. Uh, I definitely would let, do not need to try that one more. I wonder if that was that one's on board game arena. That's one that should be. If it isn't. Yeah, I don't know. The smir- I don't know. Does Smirk and Laughter have any games on? I don't think Kurt does, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, yes, that's that's the strategy is distract Mo thinking he's chasing you. Meanwhile, you're knocking his pieces off. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I should clarify that the mug club did have an earlier seating, but like I like my beer, but I don't want to start drinking at 11 in the afternoon. Sorry, that's that must be the early morning to go with what we were talking about earlier today in the wee hours at 11 a.m. The boop is on BGA. Oh, OK. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there was an earlier seating. And I do think some people sat in the back despite us having a reserved area. I know some people wanted to watch the game, which I assume it was Sunday was probably football. Um, so what do we have? Um, oh, we tried a new Texas style barbecue place which I'm sure Sean will want to hear about, but we can save that for the after show. That's it for gaming. So that's it for what we've been playing as for next week. So what we have planned for next week. So um, as I already noted, we're we're probably going to review the deadlies. Um, Basically I'm ready to go. I I can review that anytime. Um, I would love to get in another game of Seize of Havoc. I really want to play a four player team game. I have a feeling that's the sweet spot. Also, before we review it, I want to play with five. I want to I want to at least get those in. I don't think I need to play a three player game to 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 share my thoughts, but I really want to get in a a four player team game and a three player or sorry, a five player everyone at the table because man, if it felt like you could move and shoot every turn now, I have a feeling with five it might seem a little easy, which what I worry about that is that the it gives an advantage to the players who weren't your character. That the characters who get bonus points for shooting people might have an an, an advantage playing five player. Which would be interesting if different ship types and combos work better at different player counts. That'd be cool. Um, Kapow, I've now played enough to, to to review it, but I haven't touched any of the characters in Volume 2. So wh- what I haven't decided is, do I need to play them all or see them all to review the game well? And I don't think I need to. I think that's one I might be able to leave some exploration after the fact. But I'd at least like to play a couple characters from Kapow Volume 2. So maybe if we can get in a coffee shop night, at some point or, or, you know, grab breakfast somewhere that doesn't mean just sitting around after, um, get in at least one or two games with Kapow volume two. We might be good with that one. Um, 
I, we did manage to dig out a couple more games that we can get played from the pile of obligation. Um, and I got to look at possibly being able to record unboxings up here in the, the office again, because we have a ton, like uh, you can see some of them up top there. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff from origin still to get to. And I feel bad that we're kind of falling behind. Um, and is it confirmed volume two also has dice that won't stick? No. Um, the players playing next to us with volume two didn't seem to have any problems, but I don't know. Like I said, that, that I, it's a volume two didn't come out later. Like, like it were all part of the same Kickstarter. They all, it all got produced at the same time. So I can't see it being a difference. Um, the whole thing though, is right now we are still waiting to hear where we're sitting by the phone. So all of this could be disrupted at any time by a sudden call from either our insurance adjuster who we still have not heard from the desk adjuster or a contractor, but you know, I, we're going to stop waiting for that to happen, which is why we're starting. I we, look, I'm well lit and, and look <laughs> good this week. I'm like the glowing beacon of overexposure. I was last week. Before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our tabletop bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support helps keep this show going. Dukas. Thank you. Ron F. Thank you, Ron. Ah, uh, Roger Malash. Been missing you. That's two barbershop bar nights in a in a row. You haven't come out. I'm gonna stop bringing out the uh, prize you won if if you don't show up soon. <laughs> uh, David Miller Jr. Thank you. Specifically, David Miller Jr. It ends up. Thank you, Facebook for the memory. Has been a patron for four years as of today. So thanks so much, Math Guy Dave. And then Brian Kurtz. So this this fits in well. Our first ever patron. So. We got, we got a couple longtime fans there to thank at the end of the show. Thank you, everyone. If we didn't call you out this week, we probably will next week. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift's coming to an end, and you're going to have to go out the back because the lobby's under construction because of water damage. So you just have to follow the exit signs. Though so the doors are closed and the uh, slippery when wet signs are out, even through the renovations, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Hey, keep the conversation going. Join us over on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord, which has had no damage, and everything's working great over there, over at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Well, that's all for us tonight. If you enjoy our content, leave a review, a comment, or a like wherever you find it. Drop by YouTube and try a totally free subscription for the tabletop. Plus, bell oh, it is September. You've got the last chance right now to sub to us on Twitch for some bonus or discount or something. We're not very good at this twitching. We need to talk to some older teens about Twitch. That's what we need to do. For the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast, I'm Sean and I'm Mo. Thank you and, and game, game on. on.